Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. This is Egberto Willis. I am here with Natalia Cornelio. Let, let me tell you, as it turns out, we are starting to get a lot of young Latinas, Latinos, people of color that are starting to enter the fold to really make, to really, really make America what it claim it is supposed to be. So without further ado, welcome to Politics Done Right, Natalia Cornelio. How are you doing today? Thank you for the welcome, Alberto. Um, I'm doing great, and it's so nice to be here talking to you. I'm really happy to be on your show, and I really respect your work and what you do for the community. Thank well, look, I, I appreciate that, but more, more so than anything, I respect what the folks that are out there beating the pavement uh, or, or doing. I think I think you guys are doing the real necessary work out there. So Natalia, I understand that you are running for a particular position. So tell us what, what you're running for first, and then we're going to go into a little bit about your personal biography, etc. Perfect. I'm Natalia Cornelio. I'm running for the 351st District Court in Harris County, which is one of 22 felony courts that serves all of Harris County. Now, when people talk about district court, this is sort of a complicated thing. And you, your stuff is, it says you are the 351st district court. Yeah. Are there that many courts around? In the state of Texas, yes. Pero, so the, the numbering is based on when it was created by the state of Texas. Uh -huh. But in terms of all of the district courts serve all of the county. And then there are county courts and they also serve all of the county. So... Anyone in Harris County can vote for me. Right. Um, and I will serve all of Harris County. Any felony that comes through Harris County will go through one of the 22 courts. And they're so, numbered right. So there are 22 district, criminal district courts in Harris County, and they are the ones that handle the prosecution of uh, criminal, criminal uh, crimes. Felonies, yes. Felonies. And then there are 16 criminal courts that do misdemeanors. Got you, got you. See, I always, I one of the things that I always get from the people I interview is I learn a whole lot. So thank you for that. Now, um, you, there is a part. Uh, uh, first of all, where are you from? I'm originally from Chicago. Mm -hmm. My parents are from Mexico, mm -hmm. and so now I'm in Houston. I've been here since 2011. Um, I have a home. I have a husband. Uh, we have a dog. We live in the East End in the Second Ward. Um, so I'm from here now. I, I like the way you said that. I have a husband. I have a dog. I am happy that you put the husband before the dog. <laughs> <laughs> of course. He's my love. Okay, great. Well, anyhow, tell us a little bit about um, what do you intend to bring to the bench? I intend to bring positive change, um, better legal decisions, better practices in terms of how the courts affect the community with their, not just decision, but policies, um, and some diversity. Uh, there are, I mentioned, you know, 22 felony courts and 16 misdemeanor courts. That's 38 criminal courts in Harris County. There are zero Latinas. Well, let me see if I understand states. that correctly. Uh, let me see if I understand that correctly. Houston is likely the most diverse uh, the diverse city in the country. I think it's almost like 33, 33, 33, or maybe 30, 30, 30 with all the different ethnicities out here. You're telling me that we have no Latinos or Latinas on the court? We do have Latinos. We have four Latinos um, uh -huh. on, the, on the 38 courts. There's two on our misdemeanor courts and two on our felony courts. But no Latinas. Zero women, mujeres. Imagínate um, eso. Yes. Okay, so I mean, uh, it, it seems to me like this is in fact overdue. So, um, I, I, and and it's not only you know, we, we, a lot of people like to say you know we, we play a whole lot of identity politics. It's not identity, po or rather, it is identity politics. And I think in our age, we still need to play identity politics because there are things that are not understood uh, in, in the courts that you, in, somebody coming into your court or one of your colleagues on the other side having you there can have have them ask questions about is there something about this case that i don't understand that you can tell me from a cultural standpoint correct i think that's right i mean there's two ways we can think about it that are important historically speaking right the there's a case called hernandez v texas it's a uh -huh. case that 
got Mexican Americans the right to serve on juries. And it was litigated by LULAC and a Mexican American attorney named Gus Garcia. And I think that it's a good example and reminder of how sometimes without diversity in leadership roles and, and in power roles, you know, we need that for our rights to get even recognized. My own experience, um, and we can talk about this more, but my own experience as a lawyer has been to serve in part, I'm bilingual, um, the Latino community and the immigrant community. And I think one of the things that I bring besides bilingualism is an experience working with the immigrant community and our criminal courts need to move ahead and forward on their practices insofar as immigrants in terms of victims, witnesses, defendants, we need forward thinking best practices to make sure that the rights uh, of immigrants in our courts are accounted for. And I have that experience. I've used my career to serve that community and to you know speak to advise people in their own language and, us, and that on the courts. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that experience because I think I, I think that is important for folks uh, to know if they're if they're going to be considering voting for you as as that change advocate. I think it is necessary for them to understand that you're not coming in here just with a law degree, but right. you're coming in here with quite a bit more with 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 actual experience in working with people, right? That's right. So um, I was a federal public defender for years and um, I represented people that could not afford their own lawyer. And the reason that I did that was to make sure that everybody had the best legal representation that anyone could get, even if they didn't have money. And because I'm bilingual and because we live in Houston, a lot of my clients were Latinos and immigrants. And so I was able to serve you know, our community uh, but as well as other communities that are hit hard by the justice system. I mean, it's not, you can't talk about criminal justice without acknowledging how hard it has hit the African-American community. I mean, today there are, of the 9,000 people in jail, 50% are African-American, and that is disproportionate and it's wrong, and you can't do work in criminal justice without acknowledging that and fighting against that. Um, so I've served, uh, of course, the African-American community by being a public defender on the low-income community as well, um, but, but made room, you know, like I said, bilingual, Latina, I was uh, assigned to cases of people that spoke Spanish a lot and was able to proudly serve our people in that way. And then after years of being a public defender, I became the director of uh, criminal justice reform at the Texas Civil Rights Project. So this was a civil rights lawyer and a director of a program. So we were able to define and decide what kinds of cases we wanted to litigate, civil rights cases. Something that I did there that was of service to our community that I'm so proud of is represent families separated at the U.S.-Mexico border under Trump's forcible family separation policy. And I found out about this happening from my boss at the public defender. And she said, hey, in McAllen, our clients are having their kids taken and they don't know if or when they're going to get their kids back. Can you please help? And I was a civil rights lawyer, I had experience and we had a team and so we got involved. We went down there, we started interviewing families. We put our names as their counsel so we could help them get reunited with their kids. And we filed a human rights petition against Trump, an international human rights court that we won. Um, so that's the kind of experience that I have um, that I wanna bring to our bench. I, I think that is a, that is important, especially in these times. And and I, I want to add something uh, based on what you just said, because um, when you spoke about being bilingual, and then you, and then you brought in that that you represent Latinos, and we can't forget about African Americans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Bilingualism is always additive. In other words, uh, it, it is it, a lot. A lo that is something that folks don't quite un uh, understand when they when they're talking. In other words. As a Latina who speaks Spanish, mm -hmm. your, your, uh, those things are additive means it adds to what you can actually do. It doesn't yeah. mean that you work with Latinos or Latinas only. It means that you can also work with these other groups. So, I mean, I, I think, I think in, in America where there are times people talk about, oh, we this speak English. They don't quite understand that what's important here is languages and skills 
or additive, never subtractive. Um, what else can you tell me about this court now? Uh, you are leaving the private uh, sort of the private sector, if you will, where you defend people, where you uh, now you are going to be in a different position. Whereas yes. you were always in that position of defending, you are now in a, going to a felony court where some of these people that you would normally have defended, you have to look at from a different perspective. Can you do that? Of course. And the reason I know that is because any good lawyer has to consider all of the sides to be able to properly advocate for and defend and even advise their clients. I mean, something that you learn as a baby lawyer um, is that a lot of things are not my choice as a lawyer. They're my client's choice. And what my responsibility is, is to give them all of the information that they need to make a decision that's going to affect their life. And so that means telling them the bad news as well as the good news. You know, the other side is presenting this evidence. Let's go through it. Let's talk about it. And uh, you tell me what you want to do um, because it is absolutely the client's right to decide whether to go to trial, whether to plead, um, and how to proceed on certain parts of their case. Day so one I, on the courts, what do you intend to do? Say that one more time. Day one, you just got elected. You, you get into yeah. your office, you put that robe on, you're sworn in. What are you going to do? Yeah, so hopefully before day one, um, after the elections in November, I've had some conversations with community members and attorneys to really dissect what has been working and what hasn't been working. I have some ideas, um, but I don't want to get there and say, this is what we're going to do now. Even though I, I guess I could, I think that change is more effective when it has involved collaboration and preparing. And so what I want to do is lay out my ideas for community and attorneys and make sure that they're included in the process. Um, and then day one, start to implement some of those ideas, uh, better advisories so that people make, you know, are advised of their immigration rights and start to make changes to court schedules. Um, I'll have hired staff that is consistent with my goals of serving the community. So people that are organized and kind and respect everyone so that if people have questions and they call my court, they get somebody answering that can explain the process. Um, and, and it's very just clear and transparent what they can and can't do and what I can and can't do. Humility so <laughs> is in fact a virtue. That That's, that's wonderful. Uh, seeking advice and consent from the community as you judge. Now, um, quick round here now. Where did you go to university? I went to the University of Chicago Law School and university, uh, New York University for undergrad. So um, tell me, uh, Ms. Cornelio, uh, what questions would you have liked me to ask that I didn't? I think, I think we should talk about bail reform. Okay. And... You know, the question is, what do the courts and the judges need to be doing differently mm -hmm. uh, in terms of bail reform? And the answer is make a commitment to move out of the illegal practices of the past and truly serve our communities by having thoughtful policies and making sure that people's rights are taken into account in each and every case. Um, and I can unpack that a little bit. Uh, I don't want to talk for too long at once because I know that it becomes hard to follow. But historically, we have locked up hundreds of thousands of people based on being unable to pay money before their trial. And it, it's, it's literally like our system was a schedule. You have a charge, you have a dollar amount that you pay to get out. And of course, people that don't have money can't pay that amount. Um, and there was just, there was no other real consideration. And so governments everywhere are moving away from that model. And it's critical to move away from that model because what uh, courts have found after litigation is that um, it's, uh, it's unconstitutional to just detain someone before their trial because of how much money they do or they don't have. And so we need leaders that are brave enough to respect the Constitution, 
and thoughtful and hardworking enough to start to make changes that serve all of the interests that need to be served in pretrial decisions. Now, um, for those people who would say relative to uh, bail reform that uh, the reason why we can't do that is somehow uh, we will actually release people that go in the field and commit other crimes. So, you know, that's a, a tactic that, that, that fear that, you know, that's sort of fear mongering, right? And it's not people's fault for thinking that way because the media and politicians have used language like that to, to make people afraid of change and make people afraid to follow the constitution. And so the reality is other places that have changed their practices have seen no change in safety and no, in fact, our country has gotten safer. And this is, even though we went up in mass incarceration and then we started to start make changes away from it. And things have continued to, crime has continued to decrease. And all the places that make decisions based on conditions instead of money or individual circumstances instead of money are having very successful results where people are showing up to court, people are not committing crimes, and the numbers are staying the same as they were before. And somehow we need to make sure that our community is armed with that information because it's easy to be scared and fall into the trap of thinking that all people that are in jail are criminals instead of that each and every person needs to be considered as a person and judge needs to think about evidence in each and every case. Ms. Cornelia, I think that is an excellent answer. I think that is a necessary answer. But here's the, uh, here's the issue that I want to ask with respect to reality-based politicking. Uh, yeah. That will fly in, the, um, in, in a democratic race. When you're starting to go into a race with a conservative, with a Republican who tends to be punitive, uh, I best ask it this way. Will you have the chops to look him straight into the eye and tell him, unlike many of our past Democrats, stop lying to people. This does not happen. Here is the evidence. And what you are trying to do is you are trying to keep a racist, a, uh, a uh, one based on economics that hurt not only black people, not only Latinos, not only Asians, but poor white people as well. I definitely um, will have the chops to stand up for what's lawful and what's constitutional and call people out when they're trying to undermine the need to follow the law and the need to implement the best practices. I have to, you know, you audience matters and, and how we talk to people matter. So I will probably not, you know, I'm glad to have allies like you and we all have our different styles of communicating, but yes, I think it's important to make sure that the community knows when they're being lied to and what the implications are. And we can't, our courts can't have unconstitutional practices and they must have practices that are safe and that work. And, and we're on the same page on this and there's, the solution is bail reform and better practices. If those are the goals. And so we'll, we'll, let's talk about that. I have no doubt that uh, you have the chaps and that you will go out there and uh, fight the Nisir battle to make sure that we have an equitable uh, criminal justice system. Natalia Cornelio, it's been my pleasure to speak to you. Before I end this, is there anything else you'd like to tell the audience? No, más que me da mucho gusto tu trabajo, Egberto, y gracias por recibirme, invitarme, me da mucho gusto. Muchas gracias. Me encanta cuando tenemos los jóvenes que están ahora ten, uh, cargando de lo que tenemos que hacer. Porque te voy a decir algo. Ya los viejos ya lo han tomado. Muchas gracias. Uh, Miss Natalia Cornelio, thank you so kindly for having been here on Politics Done Right. You have a wonderful rest of the day. Vote for Natalia. <laughs>